Hello, you're watching Grip Media. I'm Fatima Gunning and I'm joined today by Nuria Khan. Nuria is an ex-Muslim, an aspiring journalist who has a BA in Law and Economics. Nuria, thank you for joining us today. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. So I suppose one of the reasons I was interested in talking to you was the case of Tory Towie, which uh, was obviously all over the Irish media last week in particular where she had a travel ban on her by um, authorities in Dubai. Now, I understand that you had your own brush with that kind of scenario. Can you maybe give a little bit of background on yourself and how things played out for you in Dubai? Well, I was living out in Dubai and I was in um, a marriage and, you know, it was at breaking point. Uh, so in my personal situation, when I realized how intense the various aspects of abuse were, there was lots of financial abuse as well. So I kind of had to really find a way to to remove myself from that situation. And luckily for me, I had my parents move back out there um, from Malaysia at the time. So I moved back into my father's house, essentially. But uh, as my ex-husband did not want to give me the divorce and did not want me to leave the country, he essentially went to the same police station that Tori was taken to, Al Barsha police station, and he had hired a lawyer and they put this ancient Sharia law on me, which I had never heard of, um, even having lived there for, for that many years. But it's essentially a Sharia a law that relates to the disobedience of a wife and the fact that you are able to forcefully return her to the marital home. Um, and then she can't leave or do anything of her volition um, without his permission. So when he had realized that I had left the marital home and I had separated and gone back to my father's home and tried to get another job and kind of fix my financial situation and become a bit more independent again, the uh, Dubai police called me on the way to work and told me that they would forcibly arrest me and send me back there. Um, and so, yeah, essentially things got really, really bad with their harassment and them asking me to come to Al Basha police station pretty much every night. And these were phone calls post 10 p.m. at times and just mail after mail police officer showing up at my house once they showed up uh, together as four of them because uh, in Islamic law to try and charge me for something very grave to keep me in the country they would need something that is uh, like would demand me to hand over my passport essentially so one night they actually tried to come and frame me at my own villa with four policemen and they bought the car to take me to the station and thankfully I had lived there for a number of years and I did know a little bit about Islamic law and I knew they had to have a female officer present to take me with them if they wanted to at that time. And because my dad was back in the UK, they weren't able to come and take me. Again, Islamic law, I used the guardianship law just in that moment against them. Otherwise, I could have had a very similar fate in the sense that they were trying to take me and hold me in Al Barsha cells and, and have my passport handed over. So just before it got to breaking point, and even my lawyer said, there's no point fighting any legal battles here or trying to fight for your rights because they're going to try and charge you with something ludicrous. That was the instance where I kind of just dialed out, like just out of sheer panic, the emergency number for British nationals um, who are expats in Dubai. And the little, like I gave a rundown of my story in about 30 seconds and what they were trying to charge me with and how long they had been kind of harassing me. Um, and the voice on the other end of the phone just said, if you've still got your passport in your hand, just go straight to the airport. And at the same time, my lawyer ran out of the police station and said, just leave because they're about to put an imminent travel ban on you. Um, so I had pretty much hours. I booked the next flight to Baku and Azerbaijan and, and flew out. So when you say that you know, the authorities can, in Dubai can force you to go back to your husband, is, is that like they can actually prevent a woman from kind of traveling around or moving freely within the country as well? Yeah, so on, on one scale, you have the travel ban. So now they've got you locked into that country, right? So you can't go anywhere anyway. But within that, what they had told me is that once I got the call from Dubai police, they said, we will obviously forcibly take you in the next 48 hours unless you do something drastic. And so in my case, because um, I was a Muslim at the time and by default, Sharia applies on you if you're a Muslim there, regardless of what laws you would like applied or not. Um, they actually said to me that, um, you, you would actually have to go back to your husband's house and you cannot leave because I don't have the I didn't have the leeway of not having Sharia being put on me. So according to the Sharia law that they dug up, and it, it does relate directly to the Quran about if you fear disobedience from your wife, it falls into the property kind of laws and the way women are viewed within Islam. But yeah, I could have been stuck on two levels within, trapped within the marital home itself, pretty much as a as a 
kidnapped, like victim, and also uh, reprimanded within the country as well. And is that law, is, does that kind of exist or is it implemented to your knowledge, you know, in other Islamic countries or is it something that's kind of peculiar to Dubai at the moment? You mentioned that it's quite ancient. Yeah, so I, I had never heard of it, um, as I said, but once I got back to the UK and I tried to kind of process how, what, what this law was and where it came from and how they're using it in this day and age, because as most people know, Dubai tries to present itself as this, you know, really modern progressive place. And yes, if you're Muslim, Sharia might apply to you, but nobody thinks that it would be a law such as this. So having come come back to the UK and done some research, I've noticed that there are elements of this uh, being applied within Sharia courts in Morocco and Algeria and Tunisia and Egypt has a lot of discussions about this because it forms an integral part of Islamic jurisprudence. So there's scholars who have debated on what the, the meaning of disobedience of a wife means um, and, and ways that you can recall that and how you and join that into the, the criminal penal code, if you will. So yeah, I guess because the UAE does have the framework of Sharia at play, you can always dig into these kind of a lot more draconian laws, as we would think, and still implement this them in this day and age. And just to get back to you personally, so you were you're born and raised in the UK for at least some of your life. Is that the case? Yeah, that's correct. I was born and lived in London till I was nine, and then kind of spent my my adolescence in the Middle East. Okay, and you know you've you've obviously left Islam now, and you are speaking out quite critically ag against some of the, I suppose the, the ways in which Islam views women. But I'm just wondering, a lot of Muslims would probably say that there are, you know, aspects, things like you know, women's having less rights than they would obviously in Western countries, that that is a part of culture and doesn't really have anything got to do with Islam. What would you say to that? Do you think that's fair or? Uh, no, I don't think that's fair at all. And that's kind of one of the reasons that I do speak up because uh, I had just kind of dabbled and taken a module of Islamic law at university as well when I when I came to the UK. And the one thing that I think most Muslims do know or should know is that that Sharia, the, the Islamic divine law, which is essentially set in stone in, in, in various ways, derives directly from the Quran, which is, you know, the main source of Islam and whichever sect you may belong to of Islam, most sects would hold the Quran to be absolutely sacrosanct. And if that law is derived from the word of God itself, I think it's it's just ludicrous to try and separate the two. My, in my own understanding of how the UAE was able to try and keep me or send me back to an abusive situation and hold me hostage there effectively against my will, it didn't take me more than five minutes to kind of search up that law and search where the scholars were saying that they've got the derivation for it from, which goes directly back to Surah uh, Quran 434. And again, as I had a basic understanding of Sharia being derived from there, I went straight back to the source material itself. And lo and behold, every possible opportunity to abuse women or or have these things happen is kind of the foundations of their waiting. And you mentioned that, you know, the Dubai authorities were trying to put charges on you. We know that Tori Tawi was charged with, um, you know, allegedly attempting to take her own life as well as consumption of alcohol. What were they trying to charge you with, do you know? Yeah, so again, little things like that, as soon as they you, you make a move to separate or you try and go and report it, it's kind of like a, a cat and mouse game of, of who reports first, who's got more authority. And so my ex-husband, again, he had lived there his entire life and he was quite good at, you know, he had the, these various contacts. They say, if you know people in the CID or if you live in the UAE long enough, you should know certain people to help you out when the time comes. Um, so little things as if when I was going back to the property to try and collect my personal belongings or my documents that he had hidden that I needed to progress in life, that's when the police would start charging with ludicrous things. Like for me, in my case, it was it was theft from my own house of my own belongings, theft of my own jewelry that was given to me uh, during the time of my wedding. And then, like I said, having somebody stalk me and follow me back from my new job to my house. So if I had friends over, if there was mixed company, four policemen come up and try and charge me with adultery and you know just kind of take one of my friends away in the car so very very just any ad hoc kind of thing that they can keep you with the more severe the better because as soon as it gets to a very the, like the criminal threshold is met then they can ask for your passport and that's effectively when you, you are at their mercy okay and do you know does that happen quite often that kind of situation okay, so 
in my understanding it does and i mean it just from from what news things would pass uh kind of with when i would be reading about things okay in the, when you're living in the uae you're not told of a lot of the things that are happening there on a daily basis they don't make the front page of the paper but if you kind of when i'd come back to the uk or you'd hear things on international media about things happening there was one pivotal point where once you hand over your passport you're just a number on their system so they can keep you charged in a in a police station so not just even not having charged you they can keep you in a in a police station um for you know they, they don't they don't give you any updates everything is happening in arabic you're not given access to a lawyer even in the first instance you're not read your statements back to you so once you know they try and call you to a police station and then take your passport and lock you in the cell that's usually when it's really, really like crunch time for most people. And that's when you're kind of on the back foot already. So I was very, very mindful to, if I was going to hand over my passport outside Al-Rasha police station, then at least there would be some trail of where I've been taken or what I've been charged with, or at least the British embassy or the British consulate or the foreign office would know that something happened in the middle of the night or these men came into my property and against their own laws took me. So I was kind of really, really trying to, to push back until they got to the point where they were going to actually say, we, we, we might think you're going to run to the airport now, so we'll put a travel ban in place. So yeah, I would say that there's a window of opportunity there for people who don't hand in their passport immediately to kind of make a last ditch getaway. Otherwise, you really have to go through some of their kangaroo sessions where they sit with you or there's a judge that's brought in for 30 seconds and they stamp a few documents and you're taken away to another cell with no idea what's happening. And this could be all on foot of your husband being displeased with you. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, and you mentioned earlier that, you know, you being in Dubai and being a Muslim, that Sharia law applied to you. But I, is it the case that it, you know, even, I think Tori Tao is obviously not a Muslim, to my knowledge, you know, her, her husband, I, I don't know, is unconfirmed whether he's a Muslim or not. Um, I don't think he is a Dubai national. But do the same laws apply to foreigners regardless of their own beliefs as long as they are resident in Dubai? I believe so. When I was exploring this, um, there was I believe there was an avenue you can explore to have your own country's laws implemented. So kind of more secular laws. But if you are a Muslim or you've got a Muslim name, for example, just on your passport, then by, by default, you have to go with Sharia. You don't have an option. So in my case, there, there was no option to kind of have UK laws implemented in Dubai, even though Dubai has some free zone areas where they suspend Sharia and they kind of use international business laws or, or what have you. But yeah, I I believe if you are Muslim of any caste creed, then, then Sharia must apply to you in the first instance. You don't get that choice. Even if you're, you know, if you're not a Muslim, but you have a Muslim sounding name, would, would they kind of just go with that then? Or uh, They would assume you're Muslim. They would assume that. And they, I think they would run with that in the first place. I mean, they're never going to stop and ask you whether you believe, whether you want this law to be applied to you. And again, as a woman, you are already um, at a disservice because every single law that is kind of there under Sharia is, is you kind of just having to fight that extra bit harder. And like I said, there's not even really scope for uh, divorce in, in Islam per se. Like what I had to do in the UAE just to kind of fight for a semblance of my rights before, just like Tori, I realized it's fruitless. And the best thing to do is not go through their legal process. There is no due process in the way that we understand it. It's just going to make you kind of bankrupt. It's going to get you heavily in debt. And it's just going to take a toll on you mentally and physically. And it could honestly be a dead end. And you could just be, especially if you've got a conniving ex-husband or, or a partner. And as I said, if whether they're Muslim or not, not, but if they kind of know how to work with the men uh, in positions of authority there, they really, really easily can do that to to make a woman's uh, a life a nightmare. And I would say if if it is a Muslim man on the other end of things with uh, married to a non-Muslim woman, then it would even it would be even more difficult because the police would naturally side with that man. It is seen as a big disrespect or it's seen as a very dishonorable thing for you to kind of have your wife leave you or run away or report on you. These things are seen as very shameful in that society and the men will help the men kind of get you back. I know there are cases of people who are born and raised in the UK but in Muslim communities who are, you know, forced into arranged marriages. There's even thousands of reports of honour-based crimes, including killings, um, every year. Can you talk a little bit about Islam and, I suppose, honour killings and just, you know, the kind of aspects of it that would be, 
I suppose, very jarring for a Western mind to take in that this is actually happening on Western soil. Yeah, I think it's um, it, it's really problematic because a lot of a lot of the times, even growing up myself in the UK, I was I was taught and fed what I understood to be a very light version of Islam. And uh, as most many people might do, I would conflate culture and religion a lot. And I would think, you know, that they're completely two separate entities at play here and Islam was perfect and the religion has no scope for allowing these things like dishonor killings, I like to call them, the, these things to happen. But when you have a framework like Islam, which, as I said, a lot of these laws and a lot of these things that happen, you can see the foundations of them within the, the, the basic sources of Islam themselves. So when women are essentially... I would say, for lack of a better word, in Islam, there's a guardianship system, which you can see in play uh, at play in Saudi Arabia um, anyway, and the rest of the GCC as well. Even the UAE, for example, while I lived there and I was married, I had to have permission for my husband at the time to be able to work. And regardless of that, my visa for Dubai would just be stamped with housewife because you are essentially in their eyes, just your an extension of your husband. He's the reason you're allowed to be there. You're essentially his property. And that comes back through the very, very like gender um, stereotypes that Islam has kind of set itself in. It's stuck in this kind of seventh century mindset where a woman is the property of her man. And I'm saying you, you as the woman in Islam, you have... I mean, any man in your family has agency over you before you have it over yourself. And then you're told and the entire, even the, the verse of the Quran, which allowed me to be uh, almost kidnapped and taken back with that law. That same verse goes on to say how Muslim women need to cover up and non-Muslim women don't need to cover up because there is a severe distinction between them because Muslim women need to guard their honor by covering up. And if you don't cover up, then A, you're not guarding your honor and you've dishonored your entire family. Um, because this is encouraging, obviously, modesty culture, rape culture, the hypersexualization of little girls when we're told that, well, I was told even in London in a mosque that at nine years old, I should wear the hijab. And I did, because that's exactly what I was told. But it's come to think of it now that that's that's disgusting to tell a little girl that, you know, you can't be wearing sleeveless uh, shirts anymore in front of your uncles or your grandfather or things like that. So these are very, very much embedded within Islamic culture, but it's embedded in the culture because it comes directly from the sources itself, the scriptures of, of how Muhammad's wives were after revelations came down and how you should behave and present yourself. And also how Muslim men view their own women in, in their families and the tight knit control you need to keep on them. And again, the, the keeping the community close. So as a Muslim woman, you, you shouldn't dare to even think of being with a non-Muslim man, because again, you're responsible for your family's honor and the next generation. So Muslim men still have the opportunity to, to marry non-Muslim women, but as a Muslim woman, you don't. So there are, uh, obviously this varies from country to country, you know, and on how these dishonor killings are played out and how seriously people take them. And obviously the covering up, the veiling is different across the Islamic world, but the general concept of having to veil and potentially being killed or beaten for daring to remove it, or in like Mahsa Amini's case in Iran, showing two strands of hair, got her beaten to death. So it is carried out to varying degrees, but it's it, the commands are all there within the sources of Islam. And when you say that, you know, you were encouraged to be more modest at the age of nine, like why, why exactly is that? I mean, nine-year-old girls so think, are prepubescent little girls, yeah. obviously. Yeah, I, I, I mean, so at the time I had no real understanding of why that was, you know, the chosen number, if you will, or why things got so serious then. But as an adult, once I looked into the religion, it, it's got very, very dark kind of innuendos behind why they try and say that nine is an age where a little girl should start taking her prayer seriously, her modesty seriously. And... I do think it relates to the fact that the alleged prophet of Islam, Muhammad, he was married to his child bride, Aisha, uh, at six, but he he had sexual intercourse with her at the age of nine. And this is, I come from a Sunni Muslim background. So our main corpus of uh, how we should, uh, like how Muslim men should emulate the prophet and, and how, you know, you should think about living with the best example comes from there. And this is verbatim written in their scriptures. So unfortunately, years down the line as an adult mind, it made a lot of sense to me why I was told to do that specifically then. It's quite a jarring concept, but a lot of Muslims I have seen will, will deny that Muhammad married a six-year-old girl and raped her from the age of nine. 
And I've heard them say that, you know, it's a mistranslation of the Quran or you're not reading it in Arabic, you don't understand because you can't read Arabic or, you know, they, there are excuses being made. Like, what would you say to that? Uh, to be honest, I, I fell for this as well. And this is this is gatekeeping Islam. It's just to make sure that, you know, people aren't really uh, aware of how dark their the, the sources are because to be honest b before back in the day this was a very kind of mystified subject you had to go to a scholar or you know you really had to trust authority who was telling you this might not be the case and there are thousands of apologetics out there trying to bend the uh historical narrative or the dates to try and say that by a different calendar she'd be 18 or 19 or something like that but as I said, if anybody just wants to verify that, it's as simple as now just searching up the most basic uh, Islamic sources, sunnah.com, which is the biggest branch of Islam. Sunni Muslims adhere to this. It's on their own Islamic website. So I would suggest anybody that if, if somebody tells you or tries to gatekeep this information, because it, it it brings Islam down on its knees, this itself, because if there's something flawed in the Quran, which they consider verbatim to be the word of God, and then as Hitchens said, Islam makes such big claims for itself that Muhammad is meant to be an eternal, timeless example of a human being to follow then this brings Islam down on its knees in itself because he would be in jail today. He'd be on sex registers. He, you know, he would not be somebody who is kind of revered by all these people around the world. And yeah, I would just, anybody that tries to shut this down, it's, it was 20 or 30 years ago, it was permissible to say, oh, you don't speak Arabic. You don't know what you're talking about. These are lies. But I think with the power of the internet now and people like ex-Muslim content creators out there who are saying this in pretty much every language uh, now, it is very, very hard to deny the fact that this is within their own scriptures. And I see them scrambling to try and make changes to these as well, or try and make it more palatable to a Western um, audience by adding brackets when it talks about things like wife beating you know they try and add in brackets lightly or gently and things like that but again I think it's too little too late the damage has been done and of course like none of this is to say that all Muslims marry kids or rape children like that's obviously not the case but you know from what you're saying it seems that there is a, a legal and religious basis for child marriage absolutely yeah uh, of course I, I would say and i say this a lot in whenever i do have these conversations because they are difficult conversations and you know i come from this background myself i would say a lot of the time many muslims are even ignorant of these facts as i was because you really have to kind of want to get to grips with your religion and again it's not many people do it in their first language when this is all mystified in arabic but a lot of muslim uh, especially moderate muslims or liberal muslims they are so much better than islam but because they don't know that you know it actually has tenants as this as dark as this within them but it only takes you to kind of call a spade a spade when you see some something happening like in Afghanistan with the Taliban coming into power and then you know them banning girls uh, from going to school and then you know child marriage happening all over the place in the same kind of context that you see it play out in Muhammad's example. And I wonder from your you know you're, you're speaking out against this in your you know leaving Islam, going public with that. Has there been any pushback on you personally? Like we obviously know what happened with Charlie Hebdo. We know uh, Salman Rushdie. There are quite a few examples of people who have fallen afoul of criticizing Islam. Yeah, no, absolutely. The, uh, the the threat is always there. And, you know, you have to change certain aspects of your life. Nothing will be the same once you've gone on air and, and said these kind of things. So for me, it was it was the breakaway from from Dubai and the UAE and then taking the time to say, can I speak out against Islam, but also say what's happening there because they are so intertwined. And I know my family, like parts of my family members, some of them were still working out there and I wanted to, you know, make sure that there would be no backlash against them. So there's one thing kind of criticizing Islamic uh, theocracies and and entire nations like that, but then also living in the UK and I mean, London is not necessarily even the safest place, but I guess the threat's always there. I the, the, the law is on our side, theoretically. And I think the more that we kind of come out and speak and we've got this power in numbers that once you know how dark of an impact and how detrimental to society this is, um, whether it's, you know, a case like Tories being highlighted from the UAE or it's as you said like young girls being abducted or groomed or dishonor killed in in the UK or an island or somewhere like this is this is all kind of comes down to 
a certain religion which has for far too long been masquerading as a religion when it really is a lot more so yeah the the, the risk is always there but it's almost like it's it, it's there's too much at risk to not speak if that makes sense and I suppose when we look at, you know, we've, we've spoken quite a bit about women's rights, but can you talk a little bit about the rights of, say, gay people in Islam? I know it's, you know, legal to execute people for homosexual acts in, I think, 13 Islamic countries at the moment. Yeah. So, I mean, I think we saw this as well with, um, you know, the, the World Cup in Qatar, uh, things like that. So when when they're trying to kind of whitewash all of these like actual laws that are within Sharia, exactly what any proper Muslim country that has Sharia within their uh, actual legal framework, they they all have this view across the board, whether it's Dubai, Qatar, Kuwait, Saudi, um, and even if you look at the the UAE travel website, it would it would actually tell you that you know like cross dressing is not allowed, homosexuality is forbidden, um, it, you can it can result in the death penalty as well as ridiculous fines, and. Um, while they might not not necessarily kind of try and you know say this outright that is always always looming there in the background so there's it's not safe for anybody to kind of go there and have a holiday and just think this is like the same laws would apply in the west or whatever happens behind closed doors just happens behind closed doors because they might tell you that but that is not the case within sharia again sharia comes from the quran there is no scope for homosexuality it's a it's a bit similar to christianity in that sense kind of it's the same the same strict enforcement um, goes all the way back to their their theology and the story of Prophet Lot. Um, and it's across the board. Yeah, the, the, there's no scope for, for gay pride or anything that we have here in the West. I suppose that Christianity obviously condemns homosexuality, but there's nothing about killing people because of them engaging in homosexual activity. Does it specifically say in the Quran that it's OK to execute people for those kind of things? It, in Islamic sources, like the, the because of the uh, story in the Quran and the message that it gives about condoning uh, homosexuality, uh, the, the rest of the sources and the consensus by the scholars would be how do we deal with this crime when it happens? And yeah, you correctly said that, but by and large under Sharia, the conclusions that they've come to, again, this varies from sect to sect or like schools of thought. And as you can see, like somebody like a terrorist group like Hamas, they their preferred method is throwing them off rooftops. Um, the uh, ISIS might have a slightly different MO on how to deal with them, but event the eventuality is death and it's gruesome, or whether it's, you know, stoning or throwing them off rooftops or execution or the death penalty in another form. But yeah, essentially the penalty is death. I'd like to talk a little bit about, you know, the, the representation of Islam in the Western media. I mean, you know, you'll see the same people who have pride flags in their bios, you know, being uh, very defensive and protective of Muslims in the West. What do you think about that? Do you think that that's is it appropriate? Is there some kind of um, a mental gymnastics going on there? Are those two things uh, mutually exclusive? What do you think? I think it's a uh, it, it's it's very it's a very unholy alliance. Um, and again, it's it's looking it's giving Islam uh, way too much of a free pass. You know, it's seeing the world as very very kind of black and white. And a lot of the times, it's it's I see that the pride flags, as you said, and then this almost kind of really bending over backwards to is, to appease what we would call downright is, Islamists, or I would go as far as the actual terrorists. And it just seems like, you know, you, it's either a really willful acceptance of this Islam light and this kind of oppressor, oppress, uh, uh, oppressed mentality that you're just superimposing into this situation. But if you were to kind of really, you know, hone in into what and who you are supporting under that system, under that Islamic system, totalitarian system, not, none of these rights that any of these people take for granted in their respective groups in the West would be safe. Um, so I think it's just a matter of time because Islam takes no, once it's, it's in power and it's strong enough, then it takes no prisoners. And it, obviously, you know, politics makes for strange bedfellows. And I think this is one of those times when, when that's kind of happening. I mean, clearly, like not all people who follow Islam are like are dangerous or are terrorists or bad people at all. Like you said that yourself earlier. But I, I'm wondering, in your opinion, if if you can even if you can even pinpoint it, where is the line between Islam and Islamism? You know, when you see headlines in in the the news about like you know the massacre of Christians in Nigeria, it's always by Islamists. Or you see something like. 
um, Pakistani Christians being murdered and tortured and suppressed, being forced to do horrible things like work in the sores purely because of their belief in Christianity. Where is that line or is there a line between Islam and Islamism? So a lot of people do like to kind of make this distinction between them. Um, and I'm happy to do that when it crosses, you know, a certain context when you're talking about the, you know, actual political Islam at play or terrorism, because if it's easier for people to understand, you don't, as you said, rightly, you don't want to kind of, you know, paint all Muslims with this brush because there is a clear distinction. But personally, where I have the problem in making that distinction that clear is because for me, mainstream Islam, normal Islam, and when I say that, I mean just by somebody reading and truly understanding the Quran and then acting on it as one should, as a good Muslim should, that for me is laying the groundwork for Islamism. That would essentially, that that gives you Islamism by default. So for me, it's most people who don't know what Islam really is. That's who I refer to when I'm talking about moderate Muslims or liberal Muslims or ones who do know what it is and deliberately choose to not follow it and not in, not you know kind of carry out what you're supposed to so for me when we talk about and um, just for uh, argument sake about terrorists and islamic ter terrorists or political islamists they for me are just all followers of islam it's as simple as that islam is islamism <laughs> if done right, if done correctly. I suppose um, in places like Ireland, like, you know, most people would probably still identify as Catholic, but then obviously a lot of our laws are, you know, deeply in conflict with Catholicism and Catholic beliefs. Do you think that, you know, for, uh, let's say Pakistan, for example, or a Muslim country, do you think that there's a, a large proportion of people who are like people will probably say culturally Catholic here where it's like, yeah, I celebrate Christmas. Yeah, I go to mass at Easter, but, you know, I kind of do what I want the rest of the time. Do you think that that's kind of the same in a lot of Islamic cultures as well? Or do you think that perhaps the, the presence of Sharia law prevents people from being able to live like that? What do you think? Yeah, I think there is scope for people to get to that point um, to, you know, say, oh, I'm, I'm a cultural Muslim and Ramadan, if they want to dabble in fasting here and there or celebrate Eid as, a, as, as, as one would celebrate Christmas or what have you, there is definitely scope for that, I would say, even more than Islam reforming. But as you as you mentioned um, beautifully, like the fact that Sharia is constant or ever present in these countries. So wherever, as I said earlier, if you've got Sharia even slightly embedded in your uh, legal framework, whether it's residual from colonialism or self-enacted or because you have the, the term, the, the word Islamic in your republic's name or whatever, if you have Sharia, it is always going to be at loggerheads with any other system. And, and so you can't have that clear cut separation of church and state um, as, you know, as, as the West has managed to do by and large, because Sharia says that this is divine law. This is the true path. This is the right path. And so you are going to act, you are going to have to actively choose to turn off essentially what Islam asks of you. And that's very, very difficult because uh, again, the claims Islam makes is that this is divine justice and divine law. So it is far better than any humans could come up with. It is far better than anything we could ever aspire to. So Sharia is supposed to be, I'm not saying it is for everybody, but it's supposed to be a Muslim's answer to the world. And you should always at some level be striving for it. So especially if you're in a Muslim and a devout Muslim who, you know, cares about the right thing happening in the world, then living in a Western country, you are technically never supposed to be content because the current status quo is not what is asked of you and is not what is correct under Islam. So in fact, the more progressive that, you know, the, the West tries to get, the more pushback Sharia is going to enforce on it and, and the lack of integration it will allow for. Our government is currently discussing bringing in hate speech laws, which, you know, an interview like this where we're, we're very kind of openly, we're speaking critically about Islam, would, would you know, could be um, seen as incitement to hatred. Uh, if somebody, you know, arbitrarily thinks that this conversation is um, offensive. So I was just wondering, like, what do you think about the kind of the, the situation with hate speech laws in the West? And like, would you agree with the, the sentiment that they're almost like a secular blasphemy law? Because Islam obviously has blasphemy laws attached to it. 
Yeah, Islam has its own obviously de facto blasphemy laws. And then I think um, that this extra kind of, even even though we've got that, we've got things like, as you said, we, we have hate speech laws, we've got the Equality Act, so special characteristics are protected already. Um, and I think there's, especially politically speaking, because there is, I mean, people are getting more and more, I guess, brazen with uh, criticizing Islam or, or asking the right questions about Islam. As I said, there's many people who 20 years ago would not know about Muhammad's marriage to Aisha. And like, I didn't know it myself. But now pretty much every every other person knows that there are some serious issues or people have raised concerns about the alleged prophet of Islam. But yeah, as you said, if they if if the if the Islamists or like, you know, Muslims who are really trying to push for this get their way, then conversations like the one you and I are having at the moment would be deemed absolutely unacceptable. And like we would be even said to be like race baiting and be Islamophobic, even though trying to add things like, you know, racism and and this phobia, like and the Labour Party in the UK is trying to actually pass an Islamophobia policy, which just is like two pages of complete added protections for Islam and protections that would make this conversation of, uh, between us redundant entirely. So, yeah, I just think it's uh, it's it's more of a, again, like you said, said that they're trying to use secular laws furthermore to their advantage to kind of give Islam this added protection whereas I shout from the rooftops all the time that a Islam is not a race um so they can't hide behind the racism card and second of all Islam is a set of ideas right so that that should not be um safe from criticism just like any other ideology shouldn't be safe from criticism but the fact that they are allowed to give it that special credence is what is worrying because somehow a lot of the mainstream media is lapping that up and people are people are happy to be silenced because they're so afraid of being called islamophobic and racist i've seen you know so many people even on on x message me saying oh like i'm from the uk and i just i love this country but i'm so scared to say what you're saying because i've been called this and this and a bigot and all of these things and and that silencing is working to some extent and that's what's worrying in a country or in any nation where free speech should and truly be valued and i wonder as well you know as um islam spreads in the west i believe it's the fastest growing religion in ireland at the moment how does that affect people you know people from wherever from pakistan from saudi arabia from dubai who generally just do not want to live under that system and want to move to the west integrate be christian be secular be whatever they want to be how do you think the, the growing presence of Islam in the West affects those kind of people and their ability to just live, you know, outside the umbrella of Islam and Sharia? Yeah, I think it, it, it's a terrible situation for them because it's almost like having to live amongst or, or you know, surrounded by something pretty much that you ran from in the first place or that you realized was not the kind of life that you want. And once you've come here and uh, the law backs you to live a life independently and devoid of whatever it is, you know, communal policing or ostracization or judgment or actual violence or abuse of any kind, um, it, it would be absolutely OK if Islam or the entire, you know, concept of people celebrating their religion or their faith or whatever be just kept to that what it is like behind closed doors the fact that you know if you move somewhere like to a certain part of london and the next thing is just like you know you're you hear the call to prayer or you're surrounded by a heavy muslim presence or you feel intimidated to just show your support for a certain community of people or you feel compelled to be silent or you're afraid to send your children to certain schools then i just think it's such a disservice to all of those people who have realized how life is under Islam and have actually chosen and uprooted their lives to, to choose something different. And yet they come here and they just see the West kind of bending over backwards to create a mini version of what they've left behind. It just seems highly unfair. And the fact that we're even having to, you know, push back or having to have these discussions about Islamophobia or things like that and have special, special privileges given and that everybody is supposed to be okay with that, then that's when society needs to really consider how much leeway we're giving to one particular faith. I suppose, like, you know, the we've spoken about Islamophobia and the, the laws um, that the Labour Party, that you say, is trying to push through in the UK. I, there's, there isn't really, I can't think of an example of another faith that is given those kind of protections. Like, you know, people make fun of Christianity all the time. I'm sure Christians do um, find that offensive, but at the same time, you're not really seeing people being attacked or, 
uh, what we saw with Salman Rushdie, for example, what we saw with Charlie Hebdo, like you're not seeing that kind of thing happen. Although I'm sure peop many people are deeply offended by what they hear. I suppose it's really it's a very hard question to get around. But like, why exactly do you think that Islam is, in that sense, almost given a free pass? Where you think that if if a Catholic did what was done to Salman Rushdie, you wouldn't really think that the, you know, the media would hold back in saying, oh, this person is a devout Catholic. And we even had um, a very gruesome double murder here in Ireland where two gay men were very brutally murdered by um, a, a Muslim guy who came here when he was four years old. I believe he's ethnically Kurdish or Iraqi. And a very large sum of money was found in his home. Um, a lot of it, you know, very little conversation about it. In the, the days after, days and hours after the bodies of those two men were discovered, there was a storm of conversation about Irish people are so homophobic, such a horrible homophobic country, you know, steeped in like Catholicism. And as soon as it was discovered that the person who committed these murders was not Irish or Catholic, um, a lot of that conversation evaporated. Yeah, it's uh, it's a tricky one because I think it's been such a almost like a, a cumulative effect, and it's a very concentrated effect from like decades ago. Where I think even post nine eleven, the rhetoric that came out about how do we do damage control, and it just kind of go overboard the other way. So as far as I remember growing up, like from having left Saudi Arabia when I was sixteen onwards, all I ever heard was Islam is the religion of peace. It's the religion of peace, and you know, uh, again, you you every respective Islamic uh, or Muslim community within wh whichever country they were kind of adopted this this victim mentality then that, oh, we're, we're kind of being bashed for anything that's done in the name of this religion or any hate crime or any, as you said, homophobic or bigoted crime, um, and we're going to get a bad rap for it. And I think the media just really, really does not help when they, they come and they give it this free pass and then you've got politicians like even from the days when you know Obama was in office and he was quoting the the Quran verbatim but just the first half of that verse about killing mankind which doesn't even relate to you know anything to do with Islam it was a, a quotation of the Torah but it's almost like the soft light version of Islam has been fed uh, and it's kind of been churned out over and over again and it's fed into institutions it's fed into our uh into our public uh, offices and the mainstream media has been like had a very successful effort to I mean, you would this is very rare for somebody like myself to go on any kind of actual mainstream channel and be able to say what I'm saying without naturally being cancelled or, you know, even myself have to think twice, like what kind of career would I have? What kind of, you know, who who would who, who would still platform me? Who wouldn't? Do you just go down your own route? But yeah, I think it's been a very concerted effort to uh, hide the reality of Islam and pitch it as this very soft light religion to mask. And this is again out of Iran. The Iranian regime have been very successful in doing this. The Saudi Arabian regime have been very successful in doing this. The Qatar um, regime have managed to infiltrate UK universities quite profoundly. So yeah, I think it's just the culmination of many, many years of that, plus the victim blaming, plus our pretty much open border policies. Uh, and then, yeah, just really lacks kind of uh, an attitude towards these things happening. I, I, like, for example, just I'm, I hate to bring this up because it, it's so horrific, but it's just a case in point of how scared we have got to as a society when you saw the, the grooming gang scandal in Rotherham and, and how the police, we've got reports where the police have bent over backwards out of fear of being labeled racist or Islamophobic to the point where those little girls didn't get justice. Uh, and there's politicians who have backed this. And so this is happening on a, on a lot more kind of on a institutional level than we would you know hope just to touch again on the the rotherham um telford scandals i think one of the the more shocking aspects of that is that you know the former gmp uh, detective maggie oliver said that although there were you know non-pakistani muslims involved like the, the vast majority were british pakistani muslims um, targeting largely, I think almost exclusively, ethnically white British girls from disadvantaged backgrounds. Do you have an opinion or any kind of insight into maybe why why that was? Like, you know, reading through some of the, um, the police documentation from those cases, it's very clear that those 
girls, like those victims were seen as toys, to put it mildly. Um, what, what do you think of that situation and how it unfolded? Yeah, um, apologies again for how how dark this may be, but yeah, when I when I looked into that coming back to the UK because I was out of, of the country when, while this was all happening, and but then I came and I kind of got a better understanding of Islam. But when I was reading uh, some of the police reports and the victim survivors' testimonies, um, when they themselves were saying that you know this, they were almost operating like terrorist networks in the way that they would kind of. Uh, lure and then entrap these girls and then kind of get them hooked on various things and treat them well initially and then you know th there was lots of elements going on but they they acted more like a terror uh, oper operation as opposed to kind of lone wolf groomers or like a, a, just a, a mini grooming gang and as you said their targets were clear um, working class white young girls and I don't I mean just from their own testimony and what the victim survivors have said about when they were in their presence and the, from the things that they remember, there are some horrific times when these groomers were actually quoting verbatim some elements of their religion to them that would justify why they were doing what they were doing to these girls and why it was allowed. So some of these victim survivors have said one of the groomers quoted the Quran, actually verbatim quoted the Quran. Um, with my understanding, I can see exactly where that came from. I alluded to it earlier as well, that there is a distinction made in the Quran between why Muslim women should cover up vis-a-vis why non-Muslim women uh, don't need to cover up. And to put it very, very lightly, it's because to a Muslim male mind, the non-covered women and the non-Muslim women are essentially fair game, or at least that was happening back in 7th century Arabia, where Muhammad's companion, um, Omar, he would go and, and do sexual raids at night and they would literally not be able to tell the difference between who was Muslim and who wasn't. So he encouraged Muhammad's wives and Muslim women to cover. So for me, I can see that if you're using the Quran as justification and you're targeting deliberately non-Muslim white women, there's very kind of dark layers towards it can be considered one form of jihad because you're kind of, you know, um, you're you're marrying or you're you're kind of controlling and taking over a non-Muslim woman and then you could maybe, you know, have Muslim babies because in Islam the, the, the children always go uh follow the, the dad or the, the man's religion so there's that at play there's various forms of jihad that they think are you know are, are acceptable to do whether it's like sexual jihad whether it's political jihad whether it's I'm sorry this sounds horrible but like chem chemical substance jihad and when you look at the grooming gangs and what they did a lot of the times it wasn't just um the grooming that was happening it was getting these young girls hooked onto certain substances and then they would kind of go hand in hand with how to keep them uh, entrapped in that cycle and then also get them really, really hooked on these drugs. And then they would be, you know, rife for all sorts of abuses. And then they would use their own religious scripture to justify it. So, yeah, um, I, th there are definitely darker layers that are at play there. Can we talk about there's something in Islam called takia? Can you talk about what that is? Yeah. So takia is a. Uh, so again, I came from a Sunni background and I hadn't even heard of it as a concept, but apparently in Shia Islam, it's more of a of a bigger deal. Um, but again, it exists in both. It's in the Sharia manuals. Essentially, uh, to, to lot like to just in a nutshell, it's giving you permissibility to lie in order to further propagate the cause of Islam. So essentially, in order to make Islam look good or to, you know, keep its PR in check, if you will, you're allowed to tell, uh, you're allowed to bend the truth and you're allowed to hide and mask your identity and your real intentions and your real objectives um, in order to further Islam in any way. In, a, in any way. So there's no um, moralistic boundaries to that. <sighs> Not that I'm aware of. If the end goal is that it will further Islam um, in any way that's positive, it, it, that's, anything is okay. Okay. And if anyone would like to follow you uh, on social media or to see more of your stuff, where can they do that? Uh, yeah, so I have a um, YouTube channel where I discuss all of these issues and I've kind of got videos showing the, the source uh, material that I refer to here just so, you know, people are aware this is very readily available information. You can get it at your fingertips. So Holy Humanist is my YouTube channel or Nuria Khan. You can just type my name and it will come up. And on X, um, my handle is at Nuria K. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much.